Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the educators here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and I'm so excited for you to join us today. Now, you may have joined us earlier. We had a program at 9 with Sergio, and you got to count all different kinds of animals. So if you're joining us again, welcome back. But if you're turning, tuning in for the first time this morning, we're so excited to have you. Now, today we're going to be talking about birds. Now, you may be a fan of birds, or maybe you're not such a fan of birds. I have to say that I didn't know too much about birds, and I wouldn't have called myself a fan of birds before working here at the aquarium, but the more I got to learn about birds and all the different types of birds, some that we have here at the aquarium, some that live here in our local habitats here in Southern California, the more I found them really interesting and I have a newfound love of birds. So I'm so excited to share that with you today. Now clearly behind me, we don't have birds right here. This is Blue Cavern. And I wanted to start here for a very important reason because I want us to practice our observations. Now, if you've joined us ever before, we talk about observations a lot. And that's a tool that scientists use to help them learn things or to help them explore. And what I think is great about observations is you may know nothing about the thing you're observing. You may be an expert, or it may be the first time you're looking at this home or habitat or this animal, but observations are just describing what you see. So you don't have to have any prior knowledge to make observations and to be a scientist. And I like to start in one of our exhibits here at the aquarium, making those observations, getting our eyes and our brain warmed up, and then we'll move on to talk about birds. Now, at any point today while we're exploring, if you have any questions, if you have any observations you wanna share, if you just wanna say hi, we have a way for you to communicate with us. So Sergio is gonna put up this text line and that number is 562-286-1838. So you can go ahead and text us any of those questions or observations or comments and you can text them live and Sergio will pass them on to me and we can answer or talk about whatever it is that you are interested in. Now this text line is for if you're watching live. So it's Tuesday, think for a moment. It's Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. on September 12th. You can go ahead and text us. If you're watching later in the day or another time, we still want to be able to answer your questions and hear from you. But we do ask that you email us at live at lbaop.org. So that text line and that email address are up on the screen. They may go away, but they'll come back. So at any point you want to communicate with us, we'd love to hear from you. All right, everyone. I'm going to step off the camera for a moment and let's start to make some observations of this habitat. Now this I mentioned is Blue Cavern, which is one of the exhibits we have here at the aquarium, but it's modeled after a real habitat, a kelp forest, and a real site that's Blue Cavern that's off the coast of Catalina. Now Catalina is an island local to us here in Southern California. And if you were to go diving over there, it's going to look pretty similar to what we see here. So what is it you see here? Now, when we make observations, it could be the animals you see, it could be the things that make up the habitat. So sometimes that might be animals or plants or algae or not living things. It could be the colors and shapes you see, or it could be the actions or behaviors of the animals or the plants or parts of their habitat. So what do you notice happening in this habitat? Well, I know lots of kelp. That's this kind of greenish brown stuff right here. And there's more of it back here. And that makes up this habitat. Kelp forest is obviously going to have kelp in it. I also noticed rocks. Did you see there's big rocks right here? And then there's some rocks down here and then over here too. And those rocks are really important because that's what the kelp is going to anchor or hold on to to create this forest. Anything else you notice? Yes, lots of fish. I noticed that too. There are lots of fish swimming in this habitat. And they're kind of all different sizes. Oh, there's a small fish coming towards us. So some of the fish are really small. It's kind of hard to see, but up here, you might see a little bit of movement kind of going around. We do have some sardines in here, which are going to be really small fish. We have about 2,000 sardines swimming in this exhibit. So those are really small schooling fish. So they all swim together. But then lower down, what we're looking at, we have some larger fish, especially this one right here. This is the largest fish that we have in this exhibit. This is our giant sea bass. So we've got really tiny fish, we've got some small fish, some maybe medium sized fish, and then we actually have three of those large giant sea bass here. Anything else you notice? What about the colors? So we talked about how that kelp is kind of this greenish brown color, but I'm noticing most of the fish are kind of like a grayish, silvery, maybe black or brown color. These fish coming up right here towards us, kind of that silvery color 
darker color. Oop, there's a little bit of yellow on the tail right here. So a lot of these fish, they're going to be the similar colors that we find in their habitat, and that's going to help them to blend in. Oop, we've got a kind of pinkish fish. That one kind of stands out a little bit. Excellent. All right. So now that we've got our kind of brains, our science brains warmed up, our eyes working, let's go ahead and focus on the topic today. Let's focus on birds. So I'm going to have Sergio put up a picture of a bird, and I want us to make some observations, but I also want you to think about what makes a bird a bird. Because we're looking at fish here, and those fish definitely don't look like this animal here. This animal looks really different. So what are the things that birds share in common? So this bird here is a pelican, but if we were to look at any bird, whether it lives here at the aquarium, whether it lives here in Southern California, or it lives anywhere on the planet, what do those birds have in common? Now, as I mentioned, this is a pelican, this is a brown pelican. They are probably one of my favorite birds. I think they're really cool to see them flying around uh, out in their natural habitat over the ocean, seeing them dive to catch their food. Some fun facts about brown pelicans while you're making those observations. So brown pelicans are actually the smallest of the seven pelicans pelican species, but their wingspan is about six feet, so they've got a huge wingspan, even though they are the smallest. And of all those different types of pelicans, actually only two of them are what we call diving pelicans. So when you think about pelicans, you might picture those birds that are flying above the water and they dive into the water to catch their food. Only two of those seven species are going to be diving, and the brown pelican is one of them. So they can fly about 50 to 60 feet above the water, look down, spot some fish, and then they kind of compress their body and they dive down and they scoop up fish in their big beak. Ah, I mentioned one of the things that birds have in common, their beak. Is that what you were thinking? Excellent. So having a beak is one of the characteristics of a bird. Now sometimes if we talk about ducks, which are another type of bird, you might hear people use the word bill, but bill and beaks, they're basically the same thing. They can be kind of interchangeable, although we tend to use bill for certain types of birds and beak for others, but all birds have a bill or a beak. Now what do you think their bill or beak is used for? I mentioned for the pelican, it's for eating, right? It's how they get their food. Now. As we look at different birds over the next couple minutes, next 20 minutes or so, you're going to notice that those beaks or bills are shaped different depending on the bird. So for a pelican, they have this really long beak, right? And their beak has this pouch here that we can't really see because it's kind of tucked in. They have this pouch that expands, allowing them to take in more water, which means they're taking in more food. And it's really long and it's kind of pointed, but as you'll see, it's not the pointiest beak that we'll see today. But some birds, like those ducks, their bills are going to be more rounded. Some birds have really tiny beaks. Oh, here we go. Here, this is called a grebe, a pie-filled grebe, because their beak looks like a slice of pie. And you can notice it's much smaller. It's pretty pointed. It's even a different color than the beak of that pelican. And the beaks tell us a lot about that animal. It can tell us what kinds of things they're eating or how they're going to catch their food. Because of those different shapes, they're used for maybe breaking into different surfaces or different foods or eating their food in different ways. So one of the characteristics of a bird is having a beak or a bill. Now take a look at this grebe, this pie-billed grebe. What do you notice covering its body? I know we've got the sun shining down here. You can kind of see here. You can see some movement here and then a tangle over here. What covers their body? Is it hair like us? It's not hair. They do are kind of fuzzy. Do you think it's fur? No, it's not fur. That's right, it's feathers. So another characteristic of a bird is to have feathers. If we go back to that pelican, take a look at those feathers. Now, just like the beaks are different depending on what the animal that bird eats or where they're gonna catch their food, the feathers are gonna be different depending on where that bird lives, if they live in the water, live on land, if they split their time, if they fly a lot, if they don't, if it's warm weather, if it's cold weather. So feathers are going to look really depending on the type of bird, but birds are going to have feathers covering their body. Those feathers are going to help them do something. Any guesses what those feathers are going to help those birds do? That's right, those feathers help them to fly. Now, not all birds are flight birds, right? There are a couple bird species that can't fly, but 
when birds are flying, those feathers help them to fly. So feathers are another characteristic that we find on birds. Now another thing that we are we don't we might have a picture of, I'm not sure, but another characteristic of birds are that they lay eggs. That's right. Think about birds making nests. Sometimes their nests are made of straw or twigs, sometimes their nests are made of other materials. Sometimes they nest on the ground, sometimes they might nest in trees, but birds will lay eggs. Now I'm wondering if we have a picture, because we have penguins here at the aquarium, we might have a picture of a penguin egg. Oh, we've got some penguins here, excellent. Now, these are not penguins that we have here at the aquarium. These are much colder penguins. These are emperor penguins. But penguins, they lay eggs. So these are the babies right here, these little fluffy things. You can tell they look really different than the adults, and they hatch from an egg. So the penguins, they will keep their feet on their egg. They will basically incubate it, keep it warm. And so they'll cover their feet on the egg, keeping it warm until it hatches. But because they are a bird, they lay eggs. Now penguins are interesting because penguins are one of the few flightless birds, which means they cannot fly, but they still have feathers, they still lay eggs, they still have beaks, as you can see, so they're still a bird. They just don't fly the way that other birds do. Now, one of the reasons they don't fly is their wings are small and their body is very dense. It means their body is very heavy. So another characteristic of most birds, so this is going to be a most rather than all birds, most birds have hollow bones. So that means that their bones, the inside, oh, here we go. Look at those little penguin eggs. So they're not very big. Penguins aren't very big animals. Those penguins are the largest, and they get about four and a half feet tall. But most penguins are on the smaller side. So they'll lay one or two eggs at a time, and then they protect those eggs until they hatch. But because they are a bird, they lay eggs. <laughs> Look at these. So cute. I love penguins. Now, penguins, as I was saying, their bodies are very dense meat. They're very sort of compact and they're pretty heavy compared to other birds. So other birds, their bones are hollow. So inside their bone, it's hollow. There's nothing filled in it. And that makes their body a lot lighter, which makes it easier for them to fly. Penguins, however, their bones are not hollow. Their bodies are pretty dense. And so they can't really fly. Doesn't work very well. You can see here that they've got pretty thick bodies. They've also got a lot of blubber. That's an extra layer of fat to keep their body warm, especially for penguins like these ones living in cold weather. So their bodies are uh, have that extra layer of blubber and it makes it a lot harder for them to lift themselves up with those little wings. So there are a couple of bird species that don't fly, but most birds still have those hollow bones. So characteristics of birds so far, we've got they have a beak or a bill, they have feathers, they can have hollow bones if they're going to be flying. So those are some things birds of birds. A birds make birds birds. So our birds here, we're going to talk about a couple different species, and we're going to start with these penguins here. We talked a little bit about penguins, how they have those dense bodies, they don't have hollow bones, they've got layers of blubber to keep them warm. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to take a look at their feathers really quick, because as you can see here, our penguins are living in cold weather. Now, not all penguins live in snow and ice, as you see here. Now, we have penguins here at the aquarium. They are called Magellanic penguins. See if we can get a picture of Magellan. Excellent. Now, this is not here at the aquarium. I wish our aquarium looked like this. But this is not our aquarium. But this is the natural habitat of a Magellanic penguin, which looks really different from the penguin we looked at before, right? What do you notice in this picture? If we're going back to making those observations, what observations can you make? We see the water, right? It's really blue water here. But then it, it looks like a beach with no, no ice, right? There's sand, there's some rocks over here. It even looks like there's some plants right here. So Magellanic penguins, they don't live on snow or ice. They live in places like Argentina and Chile, places that have really cold water, but they have beaches, no ice or snow. And so our Magellanic penguins, they live here at our aquarium. And some guests are alarmed when they see our penguins with no ice or snow around them, living in our Southern California temperature. But our Southern California temperature is pretty similar to the temperature of their natural habitat because the weather is pretty much the same. So we just make sure that we keep their water really cold in their exhibit and they're totally fine. Sometimes, because it is getting hot here lately, sometimes it does get a little hot and we put some misters on to keep them cool. But other than that, they are totally fine and happy here at the aquarium living in a similar habitat than they would in their natural habitat.
Now, I do want to look at their feathers because their feathers are really interesting. You can even see it here in this picture. This is a picture of a Magellanic penguin. Look really close. It's almost like they don't have feathers. It looks more like fur, but that kind of pattern you see, those are all their feathers. Now, penguins, they have the densest feathers of any animal. Now, I said that their body is dense, right? That there's a lot kind of packed into their small body, making them really heavy. So having dense feathers means their feathers are all packed in. In a square inch, so a spot about this big on that penguin, we would count about 70 to 100 feathers, which is a lot more than we would count on any other bird. So their feathers are really packed tightly. Now, I'm going to go over to my document camera because I have some penguin feathers. I'm going to zoom in so we can take a look. These are what their feathers look like. Now you might notice that they look kind of fluffy in there, in this box. And that's because penguins actually have two layers of feathers. They have an under layer that's these downy feathers. That's the one that we're looking at here that are really fluffy. Think about maybe you or maybe someone in your house has a down pillow where it's like really fluffy and kind of soft. And when you lay your head down on it, it kind of squishes completely. And that's because it's made of these soft, soft feathers. So these downy feathers, they are the under layer. On the outside, there are thicker feathers that interlock. If we go back to that other picture of the penguin, you can see they kind of interlock and that's what makes that pattern. So the feathers kind of interlock and that covers those downy feathers so the penguin can stay nice and warm against their body and those outer feathers protect their body from getting cold on the inside. Now a lot of times you'll see our penguins, they're using their beak and they're kind of almost looks like they're scratching their feathers. They're actually making sure their feathers are clean and every feather is put in place. Because if a feather is facing the wrong way or it's sticking up, if they go in the water with that really cold water or if the penguin lives in the ice and snow, if they're walking around in that snow, it could chill their body. So they have to make sure that all their feathers are sort of layered and leveled and connected in the right spaces. But those are penguin feathers. Now, most birds, they go through a molt throughout the year. And what molting means is they lose their feathers. So I, you may have walked around your school or your neighborhood or your community, and you may have found a bird feather. Go ahead and raise your hand if you've found feathers before. I know that I have. That is from a bird molting. So their feathers grow, and then as they're flying around, they're moving around, they're eating, they're doing their daily bird things, their feathers, they can kind of get dirty or weaken, a part might break, and that feather isn't going to be as good anymore if it's not as perfect and brand new. And so that bird is going to lose their feather, and they're going to grow a new one. And most birds, they will molt throughout the year. But penguins, they go something through something called a catastrophic molt. Now that word catastrophic, it's sort of a big word. It means this huge event that's happening and not necessarily a good event. So what they do is they will molt all their feathers over a week period, a week or two. So they push all their feathers out of their body and grow brand new feathers. And the reason they do it in such a short amount of time versus other birds who do it over the year is because penguins spend a lot of time in the water. And if they're pushing their feathers out and there's a big patch on their body that doesn't have any feathers and they go in the water, that could chill their body and it could make them really sick. And so what they'll do is they'll eat a lot of food, they'll get really plump so they don't need to eat for about a week or two, and then they sit on a beach and they push out all their feathers, they grow brand new feathers, they look very nice and all put together, and then they'll go back in the water. If you come visit us here at the aquarium now, our penguins are starting to go through their catastrophic molt. Now, it's very uncomfortable for those penguins. It's kind of funny for us because they look so goofy when they're going through their molt because they've got patches of feathers, feathers are sticking out of their face, feather, they're missing feathers in places. And then if you walk around, oh, here's a penguin going through their molt. Not here, but you can see this penguin is not looking at, in as tip-top shape as they can look. They're missing feathers here, they're missing some on their face, and our penguins, they do the same thing. And then, if you're walking around up in our penguin area, and you go over to our ray pool, which is right next to it, sometimes you'll find tons of penguin feathers floating in ray pool, because those feathers get pushed out of the penguin's body, and then the wind just carries them around. So it happens for about a two to three week period. Each penguin's a little bit different. One penguin starts, and it's sort of a signal to the rest to all start molting. So if you come visit us in the next week or two, you might get a chance to see our grumpy penguins uh, molting all their feathers. And then if you come maybe in a month or two, you'll see them in their bright, brand new feathers. So we do love our penguins when they go through the molt. They don't love doing it so much. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of work, but it makes them look pretty cute and funny at the same time. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about penguins, but I want to talk about a couple other birds that we 
have here at the aquarium that live in our ocean backyard, so live locally. So I want to talk about a bird called a snowy egret. Now this bird's going to look really different than that penguin. So this is a picture of a snowy egret. Now what observations can we make of this bird? Now this one is here at the aquarium. We also have some that live locally. We have a couple who like to visit the aquarium, but they don't live here. They just like to kind of walk around and say hi to their friends who do live here. But what do you notice about this penguin, this penguin about this egret? Ooh, I like this picture. I'm actually going to have Sergio take away the text line. We'll bring it back. But I want to clear the text line because there's something I want to point out on this bird as we talk about it. So first things first is, let's see, does this bird have a beak? Absolutely. Take a look at this beak. Now I mentioned when we were looking at the pelican that that beak was not the sharpest beak we're going to look at today. Look at this beak. It's very, very sharp. It's pretty long and it's very, very pointed. And that is going to help this bird catch their food. What else do we notice? Do they have feathers? They've got some magnificent feathers. It kind of looks like hair sometimes. It's pretty wispy. You can especially see it down here. But they have these beautiful white feathers covering their body, these wispy feathers. And then they've got some pretty long legs. And then look at their feet. I think their feet are so interesting. What do you notice about their feet? Are they the same color as the rest of the body? It matches one spot. It matches right here. But their feet are yellow. So the snowy egret is named because it's snowy white, but they do have these bright yellow feet. Now take a look at where this bird is living. It's very different from what the penguins were looking at. Even the penguins that live in a similar climate to us here. But the snowy egret is one of our local species. So they live in wetlands, kind of swampy-ish areas, but you can find them here along our Southern California coast. And they like to live sort of where the land meets the water, and they'll, they're called wading birds. So they've got these really long legs so they can go into the water without getting their bodies wet. So think about it. those penguins had those really tiny sort of short feathers that interlocked and covered their body and made it so when they go in the water, the water doesn't really touch their body. It just touches that outer layer of feathers with those really short feathers. But look at these long wispy feathers. Think about it. If you have really long hair and you get it wet, it takes a long time for it to dry. As opposed to if you have short hair, it dries really quickly. So birds with these really long feathers, they don't want to get their body wet too much because then their feathers have to take a long time to dry. So they have these really long legs to help them go into the water, to wade into the water without getting their feathers wet. So the snow egret will go just about maybe ankle, maybe a little bit higher than their ankle deep into the water looking for their food, but they aren't going to be fully swimming the same way that we see penguins swimming. Now those feet, they're very special, and that color is important, because while they're wading in the water, those feet are actually going to help them catch their food. Now you might be wondering, how do their feet help them catch their food? I mean, maybe they use those sort of talons to pick up their food, but their beak is what's going to be used to catch their food. Their toes are used as a lure. Now when we use that word lure, it means to kind of draw something in or bring something closer. So what they do with their toes is they actually wiggle them. You can wiggle your toes, you might be wearing shoes. I'm wiggling my toes down in my shoes. But those, the birds will wiggle their toes in the water and because they're yellow, they end up looking kind of like worms. Now think about what is living in the water that might eat worms? Maybe some fish or crustaceans like a crab. So there's other animals living in the water who want to eat worms. And so what the bird does is they wiggle their toes to attract fish or crabs who will come thinking there's a worm to eat and instead they find that it's a bird's foot and then the snow egret can use their beak and they have a really long neck. It's hard to see, they're kind of scrunched up here, but they do have a really long neck. So that long neck and that long beak allow them to grab their food. And so they're kind of playing a trick on the food they're eating. They're bringing, they're luring those fish in, thinking the fish gets a snack on a worm and instead the bird is the one that gets the snack, which I think is really fascinating uh, and I love seeing these birds around. Excellent. We have a couple of minutes left, so let's go on to a bird that we do have here at the aquarium, but doesn't live in our ocean backyard. Let's take a look at some rainbow lorikeets. Excellent. Now, we have birds here at the aquarium. If you've ever visited us, maybe you went into our aviary, that's where our birds live, or our lorikeet birds live, and you got to walk around this sort of rainforest surrounded by these birds. Maybe you even got to feed them. So that's an experience we have here at the aquarium. But these birds, 
our lorikeets, they are not local to us here in Southern California. So whereas a snowy egret, maybe you could walk along the beach or go to a tide pool or a wetland area and see them, our lorikeets, like our penguins, they don't live here in Southern California. Lorikeets actually are native to Australia. So if you go to Australia, you might see lorikeets. They're everywhere. Think about pigeons, how we have pigeons everywhere here in Southern California. They're sort of all over. Lorikeets are the same way. So for us here, they're kind of this rare bird. They're really cool to see. But in Australia, they're kind of like, oh, just another lorikeet. But I think they're really neat to look at. So let's take some observations of our lorikeet. What do you notice? Maybe things that are different than the snowy egret or even the penguins. Or do you notice those characteristics that make it a bird? Right, I can see their feathers, but their feathers are all these bright different colors. That's how they get the name rainbow lorikeet. Now we have three types of rainbow lorikeets here at the aquarium. This one is called a green naped. They've got this green nape on their neck. Green naped lorikeet. But you can see all these color feathers covering their body. They've got this red and sort of black stripe. They've got a green belly. They've got this bluish purple head. And those are all their different feathers. Now something interesting about lorikeets is this color, this sort of rainbow color, is only on the front of their body. On the back, it's all green, all this green covering their back. And that's actually a form of camouflage. Now when we hear the word camouflage, usually we think about an animal blending in completely to their surroundings. And that's one type of camouflage. But there's a type of camouflage called counter shading, where an animal is one color on one side, another color on the other, and it protects them from both sides. If we think about our penguins, our penguins are black on their back and white on their belly. And that protects them when they're in the water. Because if you look down at the water when the penguin is swimming, their black back is going to blend in. If you're below the surface looking up with the sun shining down, their white belly is going to blend in. So that protects them from the top and the bottom. Lorikeets, they're not black and white, but they have that same counter shading because these birds live in trees. So think about it. if this bird is hiding in a tree and it's facing inward, but all you see are the leaves, the green back of the bird is going to blend in and the belly is hidden because they're not showing it to you. And also there might be some tropical flowers like hibiscus flowers around and that is what the lorikeet's color is going to help them blend in. So they're protected from both sides, blending into the trees and blending into the flowers. Now we've got a couple minutes left, but one more thing about the lorikeet I want to point out is their beak and their tongue. Now they've got this kind of pointy beak. It's definitely not as pointy as that snowy egret's beak. But the important thing to look at is their tongue. That's right. You know birds have tongues? They do. And some birds, like our lorikeets, they use their tongue to eat. So whereas that snowy egret, or even the penguin, they're going to use their beak to catch their food, and then they're just going to swallow their food. Lorikeets, they can't digest. They can't eat things like fish or even nuts or seeds, things that we might put in a bird, uh, bird feeder outside our home. They can't digest it. Their stomach is not built the same way ours is. It's not as developed. And so what they eat is nectar. Nectar is basically fruit juice. So they'll eat fruits, they'll break into the fruit, and then they'll mush up all the pulp of the fruit and they'll spit the rest of it out and they'll just take the juice. Or they eat hibiscus flowers. Oh, we've got a good video of them eating. You can see that tongue. It's pretty long. And at the very end, it's got these little hairs on it and that helps them to lap up or to get more of that liquid. They'll also eat things like hibiscus flowers, but they basically just mush up the flower to get any juice out of it and then they spit out the rest means they make a mess. If you visit us here at the aquarium on the holidays, uh, we will put Christmas trees or Douglas fir trees with cranberry garlands in it. And what the lorikeets will do is make a complete mess because they eat all the cranberries off, but they're just mushing up the cranberry to get the juice and then they spit out the rest of the fruit. So it's just cranberry pieces littered everywhere. But that is giving them all the nutrients they need. So when we feed our lorikeets here, if you come to lorikeet forest, we give them a liquid nectar. So it's a powder that we get, we add water, it makes a liquid, and it's got all the nutrients they need. We'll also give them smoothies. Here's them eating those hibiscus flowers. We'll also give them smoothies made of bananas and strawberries. They love grapes. So any kind of fruit that's got that extra juice in it, that's what they like to eat. All right, everyone, we are about out of time. We covered a lot today. We learned about what makes a bird a bird. And then we talked about a couple of different birds, really different birds, from penguins to snow egrets to lorikeets. I hope you maybe sparked your interest learning more about birds, or you just learned some new things today. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.